Hello, I'm Deborah Davidson, director and founder of Catalyst Conversations. I'm so happy to welcome you to a Catalyst Conversation. I wanna thank the Broad Institute for its continued enthusiasm for Catalyst and Shannon Humphreys in particular for working together to make the program possible this afternoon. Catalyst Conversations was founded in 2012 to open a critical path for dialogue between the arts and sciences. We present intimate and provocative conversations between artists, scientists, and the public. And we're interested in connecting the two through programs, educational outreach, and public events like this, which demonstrate the important conversation and synergy between art, science, and technology. Inspired by Amanda Gorman's inaugural poem in celebration of Women's History Month this month, and in anticipation of National Poetry Month in April, Catalyst Conversations and Broad Institute Art Science Connection are pleased to present this panel discussion, Measure of the Moment, How We Observe, How We Explore, Poetry and Science, Bringing Together Poetry and Science in Conversation. The poets and Broad researchers will explore how their respective practices express and bring into relief the desire to make something that does not exist yet, something we want to see in the universe, a measure of a moment. Our participants are scientists Bronwyn McInnes and Diane Janaru, and poets Lillian Yvonne Bertram and Crystal Williams. These four represent a broad range of both literary and science practices. The program will begin with short presentations by each of our speakers. Then they will share with each other and me as moderator their respective thoughts on the relationship between art and science. As many of you know, this is something I have been exploring for the past eight years. We welcome your questions and comments and you can use the Q&A button and Shannon Humphreys will read them to our speakers. I will now introduce everyone in the order they will present. Bronwyn McInnes is Director of Pathogen Genomic Surveillance in the Broad Institute's Infectious Disease and Microbiome Pro Program. She also co-leads the Broad's Multidisciplinary Global Health Initiative and is a visiting scientist at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. She works to leverage and integrate the expertise and resources of these institutions to drive innovative infectious disease genomics research and to translate this onto practical applications for global health. Her primary source, a uh, primary focus is on developing uh, deployable, deployable genomic data and tools for malaria surveillance and viral outbreak response and building local capacity to integrate these into routine practice in lower resource countries. She also serves as a technical advisor to the World Health Organization to develop genomic data use cases and data sharing guidelines for their global pandemic preparedness strategy. In October 2017, Crystal Williams joined Boston University as Associate Provost for Diversity and Inclusion. In 2020, she became Vice President and Associate Provost for Community and Inclusion with an expanded portfolio that includes BU's Arts Initiative, Organizational Development and Learning Function, Living and Learning Centers, in addition to BU Diversity and Inclusion. She is a poet and essayist has, and has published four collections of poems, most recently Detroit is Barn, a finalist for the National Poetry Series, Cleveland State Open Book Prize, and the Maine Book Award. Her third collection, Troubled Tongues, was awarded the 2009 Naomi Long Medigate Poetry Prize and was a finalist for the 2009 Oregon Book Award, the Idaho Poetry Prize, and Crab Orchard Poetry Prize. Lillian Yvonne Bertram is an associate professor in the Department of English at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, where they teach in and direct the UMass Boston MFA in Creative Writing Program. They have previously taught at St. Lawrence University, Ithaca College, and Williams College. They also direct the Chautauqua Institute's Writers' Festival. They are the author of Poetry Collections, Travesty Generator, winner of the 2018 Naomi Press Poetry Prize and finalist for the National Poetry Series. Travesty Generator received the 2020 Poetry Society of America Anna Rabinowitz Prize for interdisciplinary and venturesome work. 
Diane Janaru is a postdoc fellow in the Carlson Lab. Diane's background is in mathematical biology with a focus during her earlier postdoc work at University of Washington on quantifying the fidelity and flexibility of the epigenetic information encoded by DNA milathion. She was previously on the biology faculty at Westfield State University, where she taught genetics, mathematical biology, and cell and molecular biology, and developed an introductory course on bioinformatics and programming. At the UMass Medical School, Diane aims to apply her interest in evolution, epigenetics, and mathematical modeling to invest genetic modulators of cholera susceptibility. So those are our introductions and Bronwyn, we're gonna start with you. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Deborah. And I uh, just want to uh, say it's such an honor and truly a delight to be here, um, to be part of this conversation that brings art and science together. I think despite being kind of formally, I would say a scientist, um, I, uh, I have a close affiliation for the arts and have in fact come to believe and experience that the very best scientists are in fact themselves artists, um, just applying that creativity in the context of scientific structure. Um, so I think these worlds are much closer than we often think they are. Um, so I myself uh, double majored in college in, in genetics, um, which landed me ultimately at the road, but also in English literature. And although I went on to do a PhD in molecular biology, I often think that it was Charles Bukowski who actually got me through grad school. Um, and as Deborah mentioned, my, my current day work is uh, focused on infectious diseases and in particular, bringing the kind of resources that the Broad Institute um, has in terms of genomics and data science to bear on the age old and, and unfortunately current day kind of scourges to mankind of infectious diseases. Um, the gist of the work that I do and that I do together with many um, colleagues across the Broad involves advancing, advancing new ways to track the evolution and spread of infectious diseases using the mutations that naturally happen in the genetic code of microbes as they uh, spread between people and evolve and eventually potentially become more transmissible or more virulent as we're seeing with COVID. And then also use that information to track how they're spreading between people and communities, like a new way of doing contact tracing where you ask the virus where it's been and, and who it's been in contact with rather than the people. So until recently, um, a lot of this work has been done in kind of academic research mode and mostly focusing in lower income settings, largely in West Africa, um, looking at things like Ebola and Lassa fever and malaria and, and infectious diseases that, you know, fortunately in the US, um, you know, we don't have to think about as a, as a daily threat. Um, and really trying to show the potential of this new genomic approach to infectious disease surveillance and, and to convince funders and governments that they should invest in it, that this is a powerful new tool in the toolkit in the fight against infectious diseases like these. Um, and in fact, uh, along with my close colleague, Pardee Sabeti and our whole team, um, we spent much of 2019, if you can remember back that far, writing a proposal for what we called a pandemic preemption and response system that we called Sentinel with the opening line of that grant proposal being, the world is not prepared for a global pandemic. Um, and ironically, we submitted that uh, proposal in December of 2019, just as the word novel coronavirus was just coming onto our radar as, as kind of viral outbreak um, kind of specialists in a way. Um, and, and it was well in February of 2020, um, sitting actually in Senegal, West Africa, um, where we were, our team was there launching a new, a new project for um, genomic surveillance of malaria at the time um, that we learned that this project would be funded, our, our pandemic prevention system in, uh, in February, 2020. 
Um, and ironically, we were, were there also looking out at Gore Island off the coast of Senegal, who, uh, which you may, may not know, but um, is, is kind of world famous for being one of the last um, points of land where many uh, slaves uh, touched African soil before being um, brought to the New World. Um, so just a really kind of complex time for us and, and really not fully appreciating in that moment all that we were about to be embarking on um, as, as, as viral genomic scientists and just as citizens of the world. So for me, meeting this moment most recently has really been about stepping up to respond to COVID both at home and working with the CDC and, and the departments of health in states in, in Massachusetts and, and around the Northeast. Um, to bring this genomic surveillance to meet the challenge of COVID um, and simultaneously supporting our partners in West Africa to protect their communities from COVID and from the infectious diseases that are a, a threat to them all the time. And so this wasn't a grant anymore. It wasn't a fire drill. It wasn't even in a far off place with low resources like many much of the work that we had done. It, it was global, but yet it was so local. And so uh, the past year has really been a roller coaster of moments, I would say, and scrambling to meet them um, and learning a lot about what we can do better in the future along the way. So I'll leave it there and hand it over to, uh, to our next speaker. Uh, thank you so much. Um, you packed a lot into um, <laughs> your five minutes. So <laughs> we're gonna hear from Crystal. Williams. Thank you um, so much for having me here and uh, Deborah for the invitation to my colleagues Bronwyn and Lillian and um, Alana and Shannon and Russell and everybody mm -hmm. else who, uh, Diane, <laughs> people who are on the panel and people who are supporting this panel. I appreciate being here. I'm just going to read a poem. Um, Bronwyn, I agree. I think um, just by point of reference, I taught creative writing for many years and uh, among my most powerful writers were scientists uh, <laughs> at my little small liberal arts college. And I don't know why that is other than I think they brought a level of um, precision, uh, precise thinking to, to creativity that I found always um, compelling. Mm -hmm. This is a poem I wrote some time ago it's titled Double Helix, um, and it, uh, it's after Jacob Lawrence's um, The Migration Series, which was at MoMA, and Isabel Wilkerson's the book The Warmth of Other Suns. Um, and it's a poem that um, uses a, the form, which is a contrapuntal, which is two distinct poems that when read together create a third poem. Um, and it's a subversion of that actual, of, the, of that. So what you'll hear is me trying to actually emulate what I think a double helix does um, and what it is both in meaning and in form. So you'll hear a lot of repetitions and so forth. It's a poem in two parts, double helix. Uh, the epigraph is from Stanley Kunitz's poem, The Layers. I have walked through many lives, some of them my own. One, at night, my father played piano and sang, his voice our raft on a quiet lake, an island of gentleness. And because gentleness is a choice, I know something. I have told you something essential about my father and the history of Black people in America. And because he looked at my mother and me as if we were divine, brilliant, bright children of God, and because if gesture and spirit have weight, my father's equaled 2,000 blooming peonies, I have told you something about faith and the history of Black people in America. Scientists are full of news these days. We are rotting fruit laying to ground. In each breath we inhale, thousands of humans collected on the tongues of leaves, in the pink eyes of peonies, on the powdery backs of pollen, exhaled. With each draw, a millennia of history enters us and we cannot control, can only harness whom or what we host. Our traumas, the bright, bright blue mysticisms and burnt orange murmurs, our joys and muddled currencies are archived in genetic code. I am not of my father's blood, but am of my father, which is also the history of black people in America. 
At my sixth birthday party, the parents drank martinis and sangria and white linen and silk as we played on the slip and slide, while the desolate beast next door snarled and snapped through the fence, our jubilation magnifying his rage. He leapt and whipped into an ever reddening frenzy. And because pain will out, and because hatred will out, and because my father sensed a shift in the air, because he deeply believed my mother and me divine, and the faithful have second in sight, and because some Alabama-born malice had taught him a lesson to do with mercilessness, the way danger wets the wind, my father tore into the house, emerging with a finger on a gun's trigger. He stood sentinel the rest of the day, gun slack on his thigh, squinting at the feverishness at that fence as we leapt and shrieked and ate cake. This is what I was trying to explain to Avi when I sent him that book about the Black migration from the American South. I was trying to say, we have cause to care for and track our wounds. To be anything other than enraged or dead is to be a success if Black in America. To become a refuge, a safe harbor, is to be a miracle if Black in America. His ailing father listened quietly as Avi read aloud passages about the vicious hand of the South and burnings and bodies and swinging, cold chicken and packed trains, escapees casting towards a northern brink they could not fully understand, away from an ending they did. And because hatred will out and because we cannot control whom or what we host, and because his father is a Holocaust survivor, in a moment of lucidity he asked sadly, son, why do you insist on reading me my story? So we, the Jewish son and African daughter, mouths bursting and bursting and soured with flowers and fauna, rotting leaves and peonies and men banging at the midnight door, stood as an ecosystem of gas and light, fire, double helixes and light, the story of, the choices of, our fathers knotted between us. And because I wanted to touch his face as my own, and because I felt his skin shudder as my own, understood his father's stubble as my own, and because what are we? if not our brothers. And because there's always been binding and burning and escaping and enduring, and because I know no better way to understand the history of humans than to tell you the story of my father's choice to be a raft on a lake, which no matter what more you might be told, is the true story of Black thought, Black life, Black people in America. Two. At night, my father sang, and because in each breath we inhale thousands of humans on the powdery backs of pollen, I've told you something essential. And because he looked at my mother and me as if we were divine, and because we were really only rotting fruit laying to ground. And because if gesture and spirit have weight, my father's equaled 2,000 blooming peonies. And at my sixth birthday party, the beast next door snarled and snapped through the fence. And because our mysticisms and currencies are archived genetic code, and because hatred outs, and because some malice had taught him mercilessness, my father emerged a gun's trigger. And for the rest of the day, stood safe harbor, glaring feverishness down as we leapt and shrieked. And Avi read passages from that book. And because we cannot control whom or what we host, and because Avi's father is a Holocaust survivor, he asked, son, why? We stood as an ecosystem of double helixes, Alabama and Holocaust knotted between us. And because I wanted to touch his face as my own, as if we were divine, and because I felt his skin shudder as my own, as if we were brilliant bright gods, understood his father's stubble as my own, and because what are we? And because there's always been binding and escaping and enduring, and because I'm not of my father's blood, but am of Avi's father, I know no better way to explain the history of humans than to tell you at night. My father played piano and sang, his voice our raft on a quiet lake, an island of gentleness, and gentleness is a choice, is a miracle in America. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Crystal. Um, Lillian, um, Vivon, you are next. 
Thank you. That's a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, it's such a pleasure and honor to be here on this panel with some fantastic other poet and esteemed scientists. Thank you to everyone who is making this happen. Um, I'll, I'll just say that uh, I'm also a poet. Um, I work with computation and computer programming and codes, and I use coding to generate poems. So in that sense, I use science, especially math, in my work almost all of the time, and I have for several years. And in particular, I use computation as a creative strategy to randomize words and language and to manipulate language into new and interesting configurations. And I'm working on a little project I'm calling Every Unclaimed Word, which is a small microcomputer into which I've programmed a couple hundred lines of my own writing. And the program selects lines at random. So while I know what comes next because it's my own writing, I never know what line will follow what, which means sometimes things don't make perfect syntactical sense, but perfect syntactical sense is not the point. For me, part of the point is to see lines from my work out of their original contexts and inside new ones, which in turn spurs further creative acts. So I'll just read a couple minutes of this randomly generated poem as it gets generated in the moment. Um, this is the device that I'm using, this little screen here, and it's touch screen, so I'll be touching it. I apologize in advance if uh, the focus changes and it's a little bit hard to see, but I'll be reading the lines out loud. Um, so if you, again, you can't see it, I, I apologize if it gets a little blurry. So every unclaimed word, or in a tunnel of honey. First, donning a mania all my own. I made a list of names I wouldn't mind dressing. Yet, you are my ex-lover, about which nothing is yet known. We are in the last days. I know the logic of camouflage. Men motorcycle by. Money make me a shield. That slick monster sat down with us all. I make no claims to being a permanent person. It's early evening. I clinched up against dreamy red boots. Yes, I fell from my other, about which nothing is yet known. I know the logic of camouflage. Gold rhymes with ash in the highway hour. As for the chandelier, whole days I send this tongue Listen, I don't know how to rescue myself. Not a single shop will open to sell me my missing clothes. I curse and I don't believe I believe in apologizing. I make no claims to being a permanent person. It's early evening. It took all the ends to make a no. I never told anyone. Not really. Men who tell me what to think, but, or, I never told anyone. Not really. Up against, gone, gone, gone. Again, I straddle the blade, thinking, or, that year I had a thing for drunks in uniform. I've misplaced my eyes. You'll find me still, and you'll find me still. Siri, how cold is orbit? This is the time it will fill the gash. Not a single shop will open to sell me my missing clothes. And, or, please don't tell my mother. Oh, I'll stop there. That's a good place. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. That was also amazing. Um, and so now Diane is going to share her screen with us. And 
tell us about what she does. Thank you so much, Deborah. And I wanted to thank also my, my fellow panelists, Lillian Yvonne, Bronwyn, and Crystal. It's really been wonderful to hear as we have so far about, about your work. Um, I want to mention a little bit about my own interest and, and what I'm working on and thinking about right now, um, which I think plays into some, some themes that have, have come up in terms of, of perspective and what we bring from our perspective and what we can learn by stepping perhaps or working to step outside of our perspective. In a biological context, um, I think about this specifically in terms of physiology and, and ultimately genomics. Um, and I want to start out just by this, I think, rather simple statement that we are all as humans aware of, which is that as humans, we work um, physiologically quite hard to maintain internal stable conditions. And so we work to maintain our body temperature and our oxygen saturation and our blood glucose. And in fact, uh, prolonged deviation from any of these internal conditions is associated with disease of some sort. And so hypoxia and fever and um, hypothermia and diabetes are all uh, situations where the, the normal physiological state of a human is, is altered in some way that, um, that ultimately subjects our cells to unfamiliar circumstances that can, can in the long run impose harm. Um, and I think it's, it's, um, it's easy to assume that this uh, human normal applies to other species. And I'm, I'm showing here a camel, which is a, a species um, that I think is quite remarkable um, in, in the specific instance of body temperature. And on the bottom right here is a, um, a graph that this is, um, these data have been available for quite some time. And those two different um, sort of uh, curves there that you see uh, track on, on the one hand, the body temperature of a camel um, over the course of a, within a day and, and several days. And then the other tracks the ambient temperature. And what to me is really striking is that um, if, if human normal body temperatures are bounded by these two horizontal lines I've drawn, um, we, we are uh, sort of keeping ourselves within a very, very narrow uh, subset of the temperatures that a camel experiences internally um, as part of its, its normal day. Um, and I thought about this, um, so I, I've been, I, I'm a great fan of animal uh, physiology and, and diversity and have been for quite some time um, just as a human being since I was a child. Um, but I was really um, inspired to think about this in thinking about the word moment as it came up as the, a theme for today's um, talk because I, I was reminded that the stable in internal conditions typical in a human really represent just one moment in the natural history of many other mammals. And so it might be that, you know, at two in the morning, um, a camel might be at a particular temperature, but if we um, inflict upon our own understanding of other species, this notion that they are exactly like us in their, um, in their abilities, we might sort of surmise that moment to, to give a broad view of how that uh, species behaves more generally under other conditions, and that would really limit our ability to fully understand, appreciate, and I think ideally learn from and be inspired by the the breadth of its capacities to to deal with conditions that are that are unfamiliar, um, in, at least in the biological sense, to a human. And so, as I started thinking about this further, um, I really um, come back. I think to Bronwyn's points about about um, having you know many different um, interests. Um, I, I uh, was inspired to think about this um, initially. I think maybe twenty years ago, um, when I was I was you know taking a comparative physiology class as an undergraduate, and I was really struck by you know how easy it as a human it is as a human to assume that the consistency of temperature, glucose, and, and blood oxygen that we you know, have as part of our, you know, our physiology and, and what we work very hard to protect really places us as an exception um, and you know, gives us a narrower range than many of the other species on within our, our um, cl comparatively closely related to other species. And so I've just featured a, a seal, a bat, and again, the camel here as examples of um, the great physiological flexibility and diversity that exists um, in our you know, more, somewhat more distantly related species. And so just looking across here, I filled in circles um, indicating uh, cases where in contrast to us, that other species is able to, as part of its normal dealings with the world, uh, cope with these alternate conditions that, that are variable across its life. And so um, just by way of example, the squirrel monkey can you know, deal with um, great variation in blood glucose that would be harmful to a human. And you can see that um, there are a whole bunch of species, um, mustelids and honey badgers and, and camels and a bunch of others as well that can deal with variable temperature. And I was really um, struck by this because I think that 
a lot of human medical um, medical uh, concerns have to do with trying to understand how can we stabilize internal physiology so that we can get um, in, in cases of disease, so where, where, for example, blood glucose is perturbed in, in diabetes, how can we get back to back to a state where it is more along the lines of a, a, the normal consistency in a, uh, in a human? But it turns out that that's not what the cells of other mammals encounter as part of their um, part of their lives. And, and I just want to point out more generally here this, this notion of perspective and that I think it's really helpful to just zoom out a little bit in terms of evolutionary biology to realize that if we um, too strongly assume that the, uh, the physiology of a human can tell us completely about what, what other species are encountering, um, we'll really miss some of the most interesting properties that ultimately, in a more practical sense, may be able to tell us about strategies for protecting human health. And so um, inspired by that uh, sort of view of, of this, um, the physiological flexibility of other species, um, I'm very fortunate to be working with a number of collaborators that I've listed um, at, at the left here on this project to try to learn more by sort of stepping back from this single moment perspective on many different species to try to better understand how they um, deal with conditions that human cells never encounter. And so uh, to do this, we have partnered with um, the frozen zoo at San Diego Zoo Global, which has this really, I think, amazing collection of cells from, from many, many different species. And so um, you can basically take those cells and um, put all of them in some common environment. And, and as you can see, um, we're gonna start with thinking about how do those cells respond under what we would, you know, from the narrow human perspective define as normal conditions, and then subject them to all of them, all of the different species to conditions that better mimic uh, the way those cells experience the environment in the organism that they reside in to try to understand what they do that human cells do not in these disease states. And I, I think that, um, we have no idea how this will turn out. We know at the moment only that these cells are able to cope with conditions that are that are damaging to human ones. And so I'm really um, fascinated and, and feel very fortunate to be able to start out with this rather complete lack of understanding for what, what these cells really do that, that um, is not it certainly is not known to us in the scientific sense of data, but is also, I think, not accessible as a perspective um, uh, without sort of uh, taking humans out of the, the center of our understanding of what it means to be an organism, a species, or in particular, a mammal. Um, so I'm not sure what will happen next, but um, I'm really um, excited to embark upon this and really grateful to have this opportunity to, to talk with everyone here. So thank you very much. Thank you all for um, really terrific, albeit short presentations. We're gonna jump into um, the conversation and I'd like to um, get things going with a couple of quotes um, from writers actually. And the first one is from novelist and physicist, Alan Lightman, who said to me once a long time ago, that both art and science need metaphor to find something new. And at some point, science needs to go beyond metaphor and art can stay within metaphor. It's something that has stayed with me for a long time. Jane Hirschfield from the Poets for Science website says, poetry and science each seek to ground our lives in both what exists and the sense of the large of mystery and awe. Every scientist I know is grounded in curiosity, wonder, the spirit of exploration and the spirit of service, as is every poet. And from Maria Popova's Brain Pickings newsletter, Ursula K. Le Guin's lovely insistence that science describes accurately from outside, poetry describes accurately from inside, and both celebrate what they describe. So um, those are just kind of seeds and um, maybe I'll direct this uh, first question just to get us going to uh, Lily and Yvonne. Um, and it is this, in both art and science, one works towards creating something that does not exist yet. Actually for everybody, this is pertinent. Something we want to see in the universe, a measure of a moment. So maybe Lily and Yvonne, you can get us started. Sure, um, I mean, that's a great question. 
Um, it, does it resonate? The short answer is yes. Um, <laughs> part of why uh, I, I do poetry that I'm engaged in creative writing has a lot to do with writing the things that I want to read, uh, things that I, have, I haven't yet discovered or that, I, I, that don't exist. Um, granted, I haven't you know, read everything, I haven't discovered everything, so I, I also don't really know. But um, in terms of you know, thinking, you know, I, I sort of demoed um, you know, how I work with randomization and computers. One of the things that I really enjoy about these methods as a creative strategy is that I, I always end up creating something at or at least putting words in an order that I hadn't before. Um, and it's very ephemeral because none of this material gets saved, right? It appears once. It's like that iteration of this random poem will never happen again. The ephemerality is something I really enjoy. Um, but it also creates something that I don't, that I have not imagined that I want to see. And mm -hmm. that's also very stimulating for me because I know that my imagination has limits. Um, and so if it's just about creating what I want to see in the universe, then there's, all, there's only so many things I'm gonna really come up with, right? So I, I like employing strategies that do things that I have yet to, that I haven't conceived of, right? That I only realize is happening um, when it happens. Um, and again, that's part of the, the real appeal uh, to different kinds of creative strategies for me. Another way you just brought to mind that, um, that it, we create roadblocks to, you know, to kind of overcome, you know, that's yeah. what, you know, getting to see more that you didn't know you could see. But Diane, I see you nodding there. Do you want to jump in? Yes, and uh, Lillian Vaughn's comment really resonates with me. I, I think there's, in, in science in particular, just to, just to follow up on exactly that, this um, uh, challenge and opportunity really to try to figure out um, sort of the boundary or maybe ideally to dissemble the boundary between observation and more targeted exploration um, in the sense that, you know, and, and one would like to develop experiments that address specific questions that, that, you know, inspire one. And at the same time, one wishes for those experiments not to sort of derive their own results and to, to let biological systems reveal the full scope of their capacity and wonder um, without uh, one's own preconceptions really um, to uh, severely canalizing what one can see from them. And so um, I was really struck by what you just said and also by your, your uh, poetry approach and, and your, your use of randomization to, to um, sort of start from something that is in part known to sort of reveal something in the process that's unknown. So I thank you so much. I really, it was wonderful to see how that happens. <laughs> yeah, this is the synergy I was hoping for and here we are. So, um, Maybe I'm gonna ask Bronwyn to get us started on this next idea, which is something we discussed in our previous Broad Catalyst program, um, which we did in November, um, was the idea of the criticality of hope that was actually in our title and optimism um, that is in this now very prolonged uh, moment. Mm -hmm. And um, Bronwyn, perhaps you can um, get us going with that. Sure. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it's such a relevant point um, for the, for the many moments that, that we find ourselves in now that I guess I can just speak from, from my angle as it relates to the COVID pandemic. Um, and actually, I was just going to connect it back to, you referred to Amanda Grossman's brilliant inaugural poem in your opening um, remarks. And, uh, and there's a couple of lines from there that resonated with me and connected to the theme of the criticality of hope. Um, I, this is somewhat of a paraphrase, I think, but she said, we, we did not feel prepared to be heirs of such a terrifying hour, but within it, we found the power to author a new chapter. Um, and I think for those of us who um, may have thought of themselves as uh, viral outbreak response scientists um, before COVID, uh, we did not feel prepared uh, for, for what uh, the universe was bringing to us. I think that's true really at every level around the world and we're all experiencing that together. Um, but it is the hope and the optimism of science um, that I think is, is driving us through or getting us through this, both in, in the kind of existential sense, but also in the very real sense of the innovations around 
uh, vaccines and and uh, and surveillance and new approaches to tackling this problem. And I think that um, despite the ups and downs of of the way that science and medicine has been able to respond to this pandemic, um, we are inspired and need to be inspired by the progress that we're making, both for this current moment and, and for the future. Um, and I think it's the, uh, the power that we are, are finding in this, this chapter and how we can apply this in, in subsequent chapters um, down the road that, uh, that helps keep us going even through these, these dark hours of the moment. Does uh, anyone else want to jump in? I guess um, I would say that I'm always interested in, in words like hope and faith. Um, and in this particular moment, uh, in this context, it strikes me that, particularly in this context of this conversation, that hopefulness, besides sort of being a, a sort of feel good word that we strive to sort of use and think about, it seems to me like hopefulness is actually a practice and a strategy um, for looking to, you know, forward looking. And in science, hopefulness, and in, in my body as a poet, right, hopefulness is um, also a way of enacting consistently curiosity about a future that I do not know. And that I don't yet see. And, um, and I don't know that for me, that seems like an important distinction. So, so that it's something that we're doing as an action and it's not just something that wells up from the spirit, but rather it is a way of being in the world. And it occurs to me that for those of us who are constantly making things out of nothing <laughs> or looking for answers, um, we don't talk about that work as being hopeful, but it is hopeful work. Yeah, yeah. if I could, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, yeah, if I could dovetail on that, right, this idea of hope as a practice and forward looking, I sort of, you know, I'm interested in the criticality part of that question, right, and thinking of criticality in the nuclear sense of something that is self-sustaining, right, a reaction that's self-sustaining. Um, and, and that's kind of the same thing with, with practicing hope, right? Not as something that just kind of happens, but as something that you have to, you have to work for and sustain and keep, you know, and it has to be self-sustaining, right? And generating. Um, and that is something that we do as poets, uh, obviously like, again, trying to build something out of nothing, um, out of words, but also I'm, I assume the same goes, right? Um, for scientists. Um. I, I would I would think so. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I was um, <laughs> that is science. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Um, something that um, I see around me uh, a lot, which is uh, a kind of just I, I see it. I mean, in the science world, in your worlds, it's absolutely part of what you do. But I see more and more with. Um, given all kinds of moments that we've been experiencing over the past several years. Um, anyway, the, the need or the desire for artists to be doing something to help, you know, to kind of fix things. And, you know, I, I really see it as a kind of paradigm shift. Um, I don't know how, what other folks, how other folks experience it, but, you know, that we that we must come together to, to make change. And um, mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of visual artists who, you know, part of their studio, or in addition to their studio practice, that they also have a so, kind of social justice um, aspect to, the, to their work. So I don't know if anyone wants to respond to that idea. You, you know, the, um, it's, a, it's a fascinating question. I've been railing in the last like, two months, and I don't know why it's annoyed me so much in the last two months, but it has. <laughs> um, the, the, there is not a social justice movement or a social movement that I can think of, of any import or magnitude in which the arts have not served a, an essential function. Mm -hmm. And we, as a community, particularly in this country, um, persistently um, 
diminish the power uh, and usefulness of the arts as a lever for change making. And um, it concerns me to no end because as I, you know, in the academy, I see lots of people turning towards the social sciences, towards bench sciences, et cetera, which is fantastic. And I see a, a way in which the creative arts are sort of that, the, the, the sort of nice creative people over there. <laughs> the sort of wacky people who sit on the floor and do handstands and dress strange, <laughs> right? And yet, if, if, what, if what we're doing is actually trying to offer a new way for people to understand the common project of being a human, right? In this particular moment, whatever the moment is, through poetry, through dance, through song, through whatever it is, that's a, a critically important element it would be as if, and I'm not a bench scientist, so I don't know, but I think you all need beakers, don't you? Don't you need a solution <laughs> to put things into? So it would be like trying to do science without solution or without a microscope. Mm -hmm. I, I just, it really annoys me that the, <laughs> that the arts, I love this conversation because the arts are so essential and t increasingly in this country, they are um, understood to be less so. <laughs> I agree with that. I, I sure. I mean, I'm in academia, so I, I end in the humanities, so I, I have the same experience, right? Um, and I agree. Of course, there's no, there is no, there. We can't look to any social justice movement or any revolutionary movement, right? That doesn't have the arts, be it you know spoken word or visual art, um, as part of it, if not fueling it. Um, you know, so, mm -hmm. so we don't, we don't, we we haven't seen social justice without the arts. But we also don't have culture without the arts. Yeah. I'd argue too, we don't, have, we don't have culture without science, but we definitely <laughs> don't have culture without the arts. Um, and so the fact that at least in, in higher education and in academia, right, that there's continual stripping away of, of the importance of the arts and the humanities is really troubling and, and problematic, right? Um, especially when the arts can give a lot of people um, the hope and optimism that's required to get through especially difficult times. I would, I would just say that, I mean, I completely hear everything you're saying and, and, and say that it's similar for science and for scientists, I think as, as a community, um, mm -hmm. if artists are the wacky people doing handstands in the corner or <laughs> whatever that, that what scientists are the, I don't know, the, the geeks toiling away in the lab, you know, in the dark by themselves, um, antisocial and, you know, um, uh, and, I, I just see the there's a social movement, social justice movement that's that's both penetrating throughout the scientific community and emanating from it as well. In this moment, um, there's just countless examples of reflection and work that's being done to um, break down many of the the barriers that have um, kept that um, illusion at least of science as being um, a, a, an act of privilege and of uh, kind of old white men doing, uh, doing the, that, that work. Um, and, and also giving scientists really kind of democratizing the access and, and the contribution um, in the scientific space, but also giving scientists the platform um, and, and we're hearing you know, time and time again now, listen to the science, listen to the scientists. And that is, is extraordinary for scientists. All, you know, before, before this moment, I think we've been doing what we could and, and, and speaking through the channels that we could to get important scientific information out, but mostly falling on, on, on deaf ears. And I think we are um, finally given, you know, the opportunity to um, guide in the way that we can. Um, from our, our perspective, our expertise and vantage point. I will just uh, jump in and, and follow up on what Bronwyn and others have, have said to, uh, that to me that feels like a responsibility that as a scientist, I know that I really struggle to, to rise to and meet. I think that, um, and this comes back to the, this point earlier about you know observation versus more targeted experimentation, but I think there's a, a challenge of trying to figure out how to you know be very rigorous in data collection without losing sight of the the need and, and um, the essentiality of, of presenting those data in a way that they are accessible. Um, and I think, you know, in, in the more um, 
the more separate science uh, lets itself be and become from broader public conversations, I think um, the greater the challenge that scientists set up for themselves in terms of being heard and, and um, communicating effectively when, as in the present situation, for example, that is of immediate import for public health, for example. And I, I, I don't present that in any way as an answer, just as a, 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 um, a reminder to myself to, to keep in mind the importance of, um, of, of thinking about presentation and conversation and um, I, maybe visualization as a component of it, which I think is really um, something that I, I, I think I would go so far as to say is struggle with in my own work, because I, I think as a scientist to get very um, excited about particular questions <laughs> and that becomes very much an internal process and trying to maintain enough of a perspective on my own perspective, if you will, to to figure out how to, how to keep that um, in a way that could be conveyed excessively, I think is really important. You sound like a poet, Diane. Oh no, <laughs> hey, I take that as a great compliment. We, <laughs> we can't figure out how to actually say the thing that is in our head. That is part of the challenge, yeah. Right. I love to see that we're all, as each one of you are speaking, we're all nodding our heads, nodding our heads. <laughs> um, that is a really good thing. Um, I'm just being mindful of the time and I see that we have a few questions in the chat. So. I'm gonna hand it over to Shannon to moderate those questions and direct them to you all. We do, we do. I don't think we're gonna to get to them all. So, um, I, so I'm going to, um, Jane says, brilliant presentations and conversation. Um, my question is both poets today in very different ways presented poems that were actively shaped and altered by elements drawn from sciences. I'm wondering if the scientists have any analogous sense that their methods of working, experimental design thinking have been directly affected by techniques, experiences, ways of knowing uh, that have their roots in the arts. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I, I mean, I'll just say just one very concrete example that comes to mind is in data visualization um, and how we represent our information in a way, in many times, very complex, multidimensional information in, in a way that is accessible, meaningful, impactful, and, and true to the data. Um, to, to other scientists and to other consumers of the information that we need to communicate. Um, and so I think that, that visual arts element of how, how we represent uh, data visually is, is absolutely clutch to the way that we think about our own science and, and share it with others. I will just second that point about there being um, a, an internal component about visualizing data, even before one gets to the, the particular challenge of conveying um, both data and maybe patterns that one finds in them that, mm -hmm. that um, is very hard. I, I can't represent it visually, but I have to say, I, I definitely think about it very visually. So. Mm -hmm. and, and also just to say that I think at least speaking for myself, um, my science is always a story in my head. It's a story, it's a framework, you know, that I, but that the story is, it is a metaphor for what I'm seeing, how I'm understanding it and how I'm layering in new information and new knowledge. And that, although that, um, that story may seem very kind of dry in the context of an academic paper, it's very alive in my head uh, and, uh, and, and thinking about what's the next question and how do you, how do you integrate new findings or, or alternative um, interpretations. It, it's a very active kind of uh, narrative experience for me. Uh, and uh, I have one last question. Um, there was a theme of the unknown um, between um, the presentations um, and talking about, you know, creating something, you know, from the unknown, and that takes courage and curiosity. Um, do the poets or the scientists have any advice um, about jumping into the unknown? Uh, feet first. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's, I think that's a, 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 a bit of a glib answer, um, but uh, it's, it's, it's really just sort of something you have to do. I think you have to be willing to, um, 
willing to not know what's going to come next and to sort of sit with that, to let that be okay. <laughs> and to not let the not knowing stop you. Um, I know as a writer, right, that has stymied me in the past many, many times, right? Like, I don't know what this poem will look like, so I'm not going to write it kind of, <laughs> kind of <laughs> attitude. Um, I don't know what the outcome will be, so, so I won't do it. But o- over time, I think um, it's important to cultivate sort of a practice of believing that what you don't know could be so much more interesting and exciting than what you do. Mm-hmm. And that, that, that keeps me going into the unknown because I'm yeah. like, it could be so much better than what I imagine. And that's what, that's what I'm going for. I would double down on that. And I would say that um, living in humility um, mm-hmm. is essential, I think, to um, humility and curiosity. I think those two things are essential and they are coupled in art making. And it sounds to me like science, right? That we, <laughs> you have to understand the magnitude of what it is that you do not know. And the, 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 the things for which there is no language, right? Um, I just, the ego is a dangerous thing in some ways. <laughs> Um, it gets in our way and it does stop us to Lillian's point. So I try to ask questions and actually to honor the thing that I don't know, that sometimes I can't even name that, you know, Tracy um, K. Smith has an entire book. that's a gorgeous book that is essentially a book. It's called um, Life on Mars, right? And it's (laughs) essentially about the unknown, the unnameable, the thing that is between us that we can actually pinpoint via science or language. Um, Um, That is uh, so beautifully put. And I think a really great place for us to end a conversation, which I think we could just, I would love to do this again. We, you know, there's a lot to, there's a lot to say here. (laughs) All been fantastic. Um, I wanna share with you, um, oh, also thank you to um, audience questions great as well. I just want to share with you that this event is presented concurrently with an exhibition, Poets for Science, Exploring the Connection Between Science and Poetry uh, at the Broad. Uh, It's a project created by poet Jane Hirschfield on Earth Day 2017, when demonstrators around the world participated in a March for Science. So this is um, open, unfortunately, only to the Broad community who are working on site, and it will be up through May 7th. Um, And just to tell you a little bit about uh, our next Catalyst program, um, we'll be April 28th at 10 a.m. with Heather Dewey Hagborg, who was last in conversation with the Broad's Bang Wong. She describes herself as an artist and biohacker interested (laughs) in research and technological critique. And so, I think with that, we'll um, say um, this is the end. And I want to, again, thank Shannon Humphrey so much uh, for um, working with us and to Scott and to all you uh, wonderful speakers um, and thinkers. Thank you so much.